Tonight, federal government makes a U-turn, expresses readiness to withdraw suit against resident doctors if they return to work. It's a bountiful harvest for the PDP as members of the ruling APC join its ranks in Adamawa and Kwara states uh, hours after the APC conducts nationwide local government congresses. Armed bandits strike in Katsina, abduct wife and children of a state lawmaker, leaving others injured. And conflicting reports trail military takeover in Guinea as a federal government condemns any attempt at forceful overthrow of President Alpha Conde. We begin tonight with what may be considered a positive development in the ongoing dispute between the federal government and the National Association of Resident Doctors as the federal government has expressed its readiness to withdraw the case it instituted against the striking doctors should they return to work. The Minister of Labour and Employment, Dr. Chris Singige, gave this indication shortly after a meeting with President Muhammad Buhari at the presidential villa. Reiterating government's position on the no work, no pay rule, the minister noted that the demands of the members of the Nigerian Association of Resident Doctors have already been met. Dr. Ngige says the government will not be arm twisted into ignoring international standards. The minister also revealed that a list of 8,000 doctors are to benefit from medical residency training fund. It's been considered by the government. I brief Mr. President, and we have agreed <clears throat> that they should come back to work. And if they come back to work, we can take other things from there. We will draw the case in court, and then they will come back and get things done. So this is where we are with them, and we are saying that even if anybody cares to put it in any agreement, that clause will be void ab an issue because it's against the law of the land. And we will not, as a government, succumb to undo arm twisting and then go and uh, sign that. Other workers have lost their pay during strike. The Joint Health uh, Systems Union, Johesu, they lost their pay in 2018. When they went on a four-month strike, they lost uh, about two or three months uh, of the pay when the no work, no pay was invoked. We'll have other labor and health-related stories, but now to political developments. It's, a dif it's different strokes for different folks. While the main opposition People's Democratic Party, the PDP, is welcoming new members from other parties, including the ruling All Progressives Congress, the APC has been concluding its uh, conduct of local government congresses to elect delegates for, from its national convention. I start with the PDP and its welcome of defectors in Adamawa State, Nigeria's northeast, where Governor Omaru Fintiri of Adamawa State has described as unprecedented the development of the state by the present PDP government. The governor made this remark during a reception organized by the state chapter of the PDP to receive members of the opposition APC who officially defected to the ruling party in Yola, the Adamawa state capital. It is a mammoth crowd as thousands of PDP supporters from the 21 local government areas of Adamawa state converge on Ribadu Square in Yola to receive some prominent sons and daughters of the state and hundreds of their supporters who are defecting from the All Progressives Congress and other parties into the PDP. The leader of the party and governor of Adamawa state arrives the venue of the event accompanied by former vice president Atiku Abubakar, who is the special guest at the event. The Adamawa state chairman of the PDP, as well as a member of the party's board of trustees in the state, share their thoughts on the gathering as they insist that the APC will no longer have a foothold in the state. In Adamawa state, it is a beginning of the journey of our second term in office of Right Honorable Ahmadu Umaru Fintiri, inshallah. And in Nigeria, this will mark a beginning of the journey 
to reclaim our stolen mandate. People of Adama State realize the PDP is the party. PDP is an institution that caters for the well-being of our people. A former secretary to the Adamawa state government who spoke on behalf of the defectors described the giant strides of Governor Umar Fintiri as monumental. You have done it. You are doing it. Are you going to do it again? Therefore, all this, the campaigns with the all people that we met in the house as PDP members, we all go and work for you, Mr. Pre Mr. Governor. Governor Fintiri on his part reiterate his government's determination to take Adamawa State to a higher pedestal as he appeals to PDP members to embrace the new entrants. PDP is home to everybody and the government have tried to provide a better platform for everybody to come and realize his potential, realize his ambition. Uh, I think uh, it's a homecoming for all of them and uh, we think uh, going forward we will be having more of them and uh, the party will be bigger and better, particularly that Nigerians are yearning for 2023. Although the next general election is several months away, officials of the People's Democratic Party are optimistic that the party will remain in office beyond 2023. It's been a similar story in Kwara states where the PDP also gained some new members. The All Progressives Congress and African Democratic Congress uh, members defected to the People's Democratic Party in Iropodum local government area, citing the need to collaborate and galvanize strength with others. The PDP leadership has shared the de campus of equal participation and expressed determination of the PDP to take over power both at the national and state levels in the next general elections. The campaigns and their supporters gather at the APC community meeting in Omoaro, in Irekwadun local government area of Kwara State as former members of the All Progressive Congress and African Democratic Congress pitch their tent at the opposition party, the People's Democratic Party. To the campaigns, the need to join forces with others in restoring the lost leadership of the People's Democratic Party, both in the state and national level, has informed their decision. I was hearing in a radio and I had a funra. So I decided to sit down, go along with them, and I heard all what they are saying. And I said, wow, this place it may be a true line. Then I now went to where they are doing their meeting. And I said, I want to join. So when I joined, and all my voters now said that they want to join with me. Over 700 former members of different political parties, according to the facilitator and leader of the PDP in Irekwadun local government area, will be given equal treatment like others. People lie against the party. They've realized it now. And this is the reason why you see them coming back to the, to the party again. The situation speaks for itself. People are looking for alternative platform. People are looking for uh, someone who can, you know, shatter the cost of uh, governance in proper perspective. So I don't want to say more, but I can assure you, PDP is equal to the task. With this development, the race for the gubernatorial seat in Kwara State begins with high expectations from all contenders. In other developments, the All Progressives Congress local government elections in some northern states have held, with some party members differing on consensus arrangements by the party in some local government areas. It was, however, peaceful in many states where members turned out in their numbers for the exercise. It's the All Progressives Congress local government elections and members of the party are out to exercise their rights in determining those that will lead them in the next dispensation at the local government level. APC. In Nassau State, the party's caucus during its maiden meeting held at the government house in Lafia adopts the consensus arrangement and Governor Abdullah Isule, who presides over the meeting, commends party members for speaking in one voice as he urges them to sustain the tempo, just as the former governor of the state, Senator Tanko Almakura, promises to ensure unity and progress of the party. I pray that we take it from here so that we now have a caucus that we can work together as a people and we continue to work together 
for the progress of this party. Mm -hmm. The love and affection all of us. In Kwaru State, the exercise holds peacefully with members in celebration mood over the emergence of new executive members for the party, a development said to be worthy of emulation. I was uh, very impressed with the conduct of the exercise in this uh, local government, uh, Ilorin West. We thank God all of them are here today to affirm the victory of the APC in Hillary West. Five out of the 25 local government areas in Niger State would not agree to consensus and have decided to have election, as explained by the chairman of the APC Congress Committee, Senator Domingo Obende. We have decided that any local government that did not arrive on a consensus list we have to go on a full-blown election tomorrow in their various local governments. This will be supervised and, of course, is going to be transparent. There is also a conflict of interest in Kano State where some members of the party insist on casting their votes for their leaders as against the consensus agreed by the governor. We have partake and we have conducted democratically elected elections to fill the vacancy that exists. The decision is also described as show of loyalty to the party. I'm happy to inform all the aggrieved APC members in Kano State that we have a brand new APC in Kano State which will be a safe house for all. As the All Progressives Congress APC wraps up on its local government elections, the task ahead of the party is how to appease its aggrieved members and build a united front that will guarantee its success in the 2023 elections. It was a busy weekend in Eboni and Enugu states where the All Progressives Congress elected officers across the various local government areas of the state. As some of the centers visited were devoid of disturbances as voters conducted themselves responsibly. Supporters of political parties file at the respective local council offices to vote for officials. In Ebony State, Governor David Umahi leads the charge by queuing to cast his vote at this long-awaited exercise. The chairman, APC caretaker committee in Ebony State, appreciates party members, security agencies, and all who participated in the exercise. You can see people are coming, submitting results very peacefully, and then they are going back. There is no any complaint, and we believe very strongly there will be no complaint. Since morning, there have not been any call coming into my phone on there is any issue in any area. We have not had such thing, and then as such, it is peaceful. Seven, eight. Not nine, far away in Enugu seven, State, 12. the APC Congress takes place across the state to produce new executives to pilot the affairs of the party at the grassroots uh, level. The Congress Committee Chairman Congress in the state expresses satisfaction with the conduct of the exercise and calls on agreed members to put their issues aside and work together towards emerging victorious in the 2023 election in the state. Anything involves a contest, some people must evolve um, victorious and other people defeated. And uh, But it's in bad spirit. Um, the spirit of sportsmanship most times don't prevail sometimes, and uh, that is what we are seeing. We cannot favor anybody. We work exactly according to the guideline of the party. For observers, the election of LGA officers within the fold of the All Progressives Congress, APC, is given a pass mark, signaling the restrengthening of internal democracy in Nigeria. When the news of 10 returns, farmers in Yobe State want government aid to reach those at the grassroots as they complain of sky-high sky -high prices of foodstuff. Join us again.
welcome back if it is joined us to watching the news at 10 live from Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Federal government makes a U-turn, expresses readiness to withdraw suits against resident doctors if they return to work. It's a bountiful harvest for the PDP as members of the ruling APC join its ranks in Adamawa and Kwara states uh, just hours after the APC conducts its nationwide local government's congresses. Armed bandits striking Katsina abduct wife and children of a state lawmaker, leaving others injured. Conflicting reports trail military takeover in Guinea as federal government condemns any attempt at forceful overthrow of President Alpha Conde. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has announced redeployments of some of its senior officials. Five state residents' electoral commissioners are involved in the rearrangement. In the new postings, the REC in Oshun State, Mr. Ulushe Gwangwaji, has been redeployed to Ogun State, while his counterpart in Ogun State, Professor Abdul Ghani Raji, will take charge as REC Oshun State. The REC in Bielsa State, Dr. Cyril Oromorobi, will take up his new role as a REC for Cross River State, while Dr. Emmanuel Alex, Dr. Emmanuel Alex Hart, that is, proceeds to Bielsa State as the REC from his former office in Cross River State. The REC in Zamfara State, Dr. Asmal Maikudi, has also been redeployed to Kaduna State. Other senior officials in the redeployment include the Director of Voter Education and Publicity, Mr. Nick Dezang, who the Commission says will proceed on terminal leave, and Mr. Victor Aluko has been reassigned from Director of Administration to Voter Education and Publicity. INEC in a statement says that handing or taking over activities should be completed by Monday, September 13th, 2021, and the redeployments are part of its routine administrative postings. We're on to judicial matters. The Chief Justice of Nigeria and Chairman National Judicial Council, Justice Tanko Mohammed, has demanded for the records of proceedings in all the suits on which conflicting ex parte orders were given. The spokesperson of the NJC, Soji Oye, confirmed that the memo was sent out from the office of the CJN. He also confirmed that the Chief Justice Judges of Rivers, Kebi, Cross River, Anambra, Jigawa and Imo states are to meet with the CJN tomorrow, Monday, September 6th, to answer questions on the controversial conflicting orders delivered in their various states. There are indications that the Chief Judge of Delta State has also been invited to join the other six Chief Judges to meet with the CJN. This may not be unconnected to the ex parte order which reportedly restrained the governor of Yobe State, Mai Malabuni, from parading himself as the member of the All Progressives Congress National Caretaker Committee. The CJN is also expected to meet with the leadership of the Nigerian Bar Association in the course of the week over the issue. A 22-year-old youth corps member, Arnold Maniru, has been arrested in Abuja for importing four kilograms of drug candies from the United Kingdom. A youth corps member serving with a government agency in Abuja was arrested on Saturday, August 28, 2021, following the deception of a consignment at the warehouse of a transport company. A controlled delivery of the parcel, which contains the candies, laced with Arizona, a strong variant of cannabis and some liquid, was subsequently carried out. Meanwhile, operatives of the, of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, the NDLEA, have intercepted in Lagos cookies laced with drugs going to the United Arab Emirates and 920 grams of cocaine hidden inside synthetic hair heading to South, uh, Saudi Arabia. Cannabis concealed in spray cans going to Pakistan and methamphetamine hidden in clothing heading to Australia also seized. Director, Media and Advocacy, Femi Baba Femi revealed in a press release that drug traffickers were also arrested in Kogi State, in Kano, Rivers, Nasarawa, Eboni, involving trafficking of cocaine, heroin, cannabis, methamphetamine, cough syrup with codeine. 
reacted to the arrests and seizures in the past week across the FCT, Kogi, Rivers, Kano, Niger, Bordeaux, Nasarawa, and Ebony State Commands, as well as the Director of Operation and General Investigations, and the LEA Chairman, Brigadier General Mohamed Buba Marwa, commended the commanders for the arrests. He also assured them that the President is committed to improving their welfare as they intensify the ongoing war against drug abuse and trafficking across the country. Staying with crime, bandits have reportedly kidnapped two children and the wife of the member representing Bakori constituency in the Katsina State House of Assembly, Dr. Ibrahim Kurami. The bandits, according to a resident, stormed the country home of the lawmaker located at Kurami Village in Bakori local government area of the state at about 9 p.m. after the Muslim night prayers. It was gathered that the lawmaker had left for Katsina after participating in Saturday's APC local government congress in his council before the incident. A source close, uh, disclosed that security operatives were immediately mobilized to the scene of the incident and the council environs after the occurrence of the incident to rescue the victims. We're in the classrooms. Can mathematics be deployed to solve the nation's security? As what the Mathematical Association of Nigeria tried to resolve at the 57th Annual Conference of the Association held at the Bayoro University, Kano. The Kano State Commissioner for Education, Mr. Sanusi Kiru, explains that the state government is committed to training more teachers in mathematics. Our correspondent, Nanchin Vincent, reports. It is a gathering of professors, teachers, students and stakeholders as mathematicians gather for this annual ritual. This time the focus is on national security. Before considering if mathematics can be used to profile solutions to state of the nation security, there's a need to address the manpower to train the future generation of mathematicians and the Kansas state government is already working towards that. I want to assure the President Association that the Minister of Education under my leadership, inshallah, will collaborate with the Association, the National One may wonder how mathematics can be channeled to resolve the nation's security. Well, these individuals who have acquired skills in various aspects mathematically believe that the application of advanced mathematics like probability, statistics, and swarm dynamics would do the trick. If you look at issues of cyber uh, crimes, uh, kidnapping, we have models, we have softwares that uh, uh, could be used mathematically to track, uh, to trace uh, criminals, and uh, these criminals could be prosecuted. I can remember Professor Gumel developed a model which is now commonly used even in the US to predict the spread of COVID-19 and it is uh, attendance uh, issues. So by the time this conference is, 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 is over, you will see that we are going to have a, a catalog of the solutions. Over 80 papers bordering on various aspects of mathematics are expected to be considered during the week-long conference. From Kano Commercial City, Nanchin Vincent, Channels, Television News. Well, staying with security, Nigeria has been tackling its security challenges with emotion instead of addressing the issues based on merit and the well-being of society. That's why it appears they seem difficult to tackle, especially because it all starts off with politics. That's the view of the Oni of Ife, or Ba Eniton Ogubusi or Jaja II. He told Channel Television's Ladi Akridulale on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that the nation's leaders must see the link between not decisively tackling security challenges facing Nigeria and its continuing economic and social consequences. Security challenge is a bedrock of any nation deal building and nation development. But in Nigeria, we are a very sensitive a nation. We do things based on emotions and sensitivity. 
we don't deal based on merit. It's unfortunate as a nation. Hey, it's the turn of the south. Hey, it's the turn of the north. Hey, we have to rotate. Why not think of merit? These are our issues. And these are things that gather up to become a security challenge. Because in the process of, hey, it's our turn, you will go and align with some very bad people, people of the underworld. You will empower them to use them as a bait. In the process of empowering them, you will now get what you want. Who told you that they won't come after you? They will definitely come after you. So it's a sensitive nation that we act on sensitivity. And the earlier we realize, the better for us as a nation. That we can continue based on sensitivities. We have to do things on merit for the betterment of this nation. That is very fundamental. And that is hinged on security challenges. If we don't solve that problem, we cannot solve the problem of economy. We cannot solve the problem of our political issues. You can watch the full interview with the Oni of Ife on News 90 as tomorrow, Monday, September 6th, 2021 at 9 p.m. right here on Channels Television. Still ahead on the news at 10, Nigeria records the highest number of COVID-19 cases in two weeks. Join us again. Welcome back to the News of 10 as ministries, departments and agencies fast track work on their budgets for the year 2022. Some stakeholders are concerned about the government's revenue, its expenditure and its deficit financing plans. To discuss this delicate budget balancing act is data and information consultant Babajide Oguso. Well, great to uh, see you I'm with watching. your Good uh, pack of dominoes. Good evening. You always have something, some something to show us, something to, you know, to illustrate what you're saying tonight. But let's dig in. It seems that the biggest concern in the medium-term expenditure framework and the fiscal strategy paper is all about the deficit, uh, about how it will be financed. What is your take on this? You know, there are several ways to, to look at this. It's like um, seeing dominoes fall. I like to take it from that perspective, and that's because... Whenever leadership um, takes, you look at their behavior and decisions, and whenever leadership behavior and decisions are irrational, then the economy becomes uncertain, unpredictable. And when the economy becomes unpredictable, then it makes it tougher for businesses to make forecasts. And when businesses cannot make forecasts that are foreseeable, then they do not hire. And when companies do not hire, then citizens do not have jobs. When citizens do not have jobs, then citizens do not spend money. And when citizens do not spend money, the economy becomes smaller. And when the economy becomes smaller, government's revenue becomes smaller. And when government's revenue becomes smaller, then the government borrows more money. So tonight, um, I come with good and bad news. So let's start with the good news first. And the good news is, the government, despite the financing deficit challenges, is making progress on economic diversification. And that is the fact. If we look at the fact since 1999 to date, what we see is that in 2006, 89%, as much as 89% of all the money that came into the Federation account came from oil. As of when the government came in, in 2014, for instance, 67% of all the revenue that got into the Federation account, 67% of all the money that went into the Federation account came from oil. As of last year, we are seeing a more balanced distribution between oil and non-oil. So at the moment, the Federation account 
came from oil. So that is the fact. That is the good news. Is that the economy is becoming more diversified and non-oil is contributing more. Oh, sorry, yeah. non-oil is contributing. We've seen the impact of non-oil to the budget. Now to the bad news. Because we cannot talk about the good news without talking about the bad news. Now the bad news is what you are talked about. And if we take a look at it, how much is the federal government borrowing? Before you talk about that, some say that the government has the capacity then to borrow more. Others say, okay, how will we pay the debt, the ones we're owing, and even the ones we're planning to borrow? Is there anything that worries you about, you know, the budget deficit of the federal government? There's a lot that I'm concerned about um, regarding the deficit. For instance, if you look at how much between 1999 to 2014, cumulatively within those 16 years, the cumulative deficit of the federal government within those 16 years, 1999 to 2014, was 7.7 .7 trillion. 16 years, cumulative deficit of 7.7 .7 trillion. You can write that down. Now, between 2015 to 2020, the facts from the central bank shows that cumulative deficits between those f six years, 2015 to 2020, cumulative deficit is in excess of 22 trillion. So we've seen significantly not just more borrowing, but we've seen that deficit go wider. But the question we should then ask ourselves is, why is the government borrowing so much? And it's 10 words. And if you take a look at the facts, it is because there is so much to be done, yet so little is available. And... That is um, what, what we have in front of us, which shows the deficit to the revenue ratio. We see as at 2020, last year, 155% ratio between deficit and revenue. As at 2008, it was only 1%. In 2014, it went to 22%. At the moment, we have a deficit to revenue ratio of 155%, and that is what is bothering a lot of stakeholders, not just um, why are we borrowing, but because the deficit to revenue ratio is so high. Mm, indeed. What then will be the implication of this deficit on us, the common man, next year? First is the common man. Um, I don't know if you're a common lady. We're all, we're all common men. <laughs> well, the first is um, you need to also have your budget. Um, as the federal government is working on its own deficit financing plans for families, they also need to be able to look at how much are you earning, how much do you want to spend, and how do you want to plug, plug this. But I also want to talk about the need for the government to also rethink, rethink some of the assumptions in the budget. We are looking at a 6.5 trillion naira. Um, revenue for next year, but the fact shows that never in our history has the federal government even retained revenue of five trillion now, mm. and yet we are looking at projections of a six point five revenue inflow for for next year. Same thing with expenditure. Expenditure out, outflow next year of fourteen trillion now. In twenty twenty, it was only ten trillion now. So we need to rethink all. Um, these assumptions. And in the final analysis, let's remember the words of Oscar Wilde, an Irish poet. He said that an idea that is not dangerous is not an idea at all. And so going forward, we need to rethink the ideas that drive our, 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 our budgets. Um, borrowing is an idea, but it's not a dangerous idea. We need to rethink of other alternative ways to grow the economy that is dangerous and wouldn't really create danger for the common man. Baba Jude, always a pleasure having you here. Thank you for putting it so succinctly. The pleasure is all mine. Over the years, inconsistency of government policies on agriculture, coupled with the Boko Haram crisis, have posed major threats to food sufficiency in Nigeria's northeast. According to the United Nations, well, the agriculture chain of the value chain in Nigeria is in distress from farmers to transporters to food sellers and consumers. A cost of food has in many cases doubled in the past one year. Poor management of the sector, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and the insecurity has been blamed for this drastic increase, especially in northern Nigeria where farming is a major source of income. Our correspondent Kayla Megwa reports.
Nigeria's economy, as most economies around the world, plunged into a recession in the third quarter of 2020, as crude oil prices dropped from $72 in January of 2020 to just $20 in April of the same year. The journey out of that recession has been arduous. But as at the second quarter of 2021, Nigeria was out of the recession, growing by 5.01%, mainly driven by the non-oil sector, everywhere except agriculture. The second quarter growth of 2021 will have been much stronger than the 5.01% had it not been for agriculture, which recorded a slightly lower growth at 1.30%. Due to a number of bottlenecks, uh, within the system. Nigeria's food inflation rate surged to 21.79% in February of 2021, which is the highest rate recorded in Nigeria since October of 2005. Communities in the Eastern Senatorial District of Sokoto State are all farming communities, but they are facing huge security challenges, which has greatly affected agricultural activities. Whatever food they can grow is sold at a very high cost. If uh, insecurity uh, 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 disrupts uh, uh, farming activities in, uh, in certain location, definitely it will affect the whole uh, uh, inflow of uh, food in the market and definitely it will affect the price. In most of the areas they, 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 they ravaged, they normally met farmers just like this, as you can see now. They will ask them either to leave the farm or they will kill them. Or they will just kill them without giving them any option of leaving the place. So most of the people are scared now for going to farm. Insecurity also impacts negatively on transporters of these food items. In Kano State, the drivers tell us that added to their burden is extortion by security operatives and the hike in the cost of fuel. What I paid last year, what I paid, I paid is maybe for a trailer, I paid 7,000, but this year is now 13,000 naira. The goods is not available because of the situation we are in now, a situation of insecurity. Not any bush, you will carry yourself go enter now. Because those are the ones who are Consumers in Meduguri are groaning under an over 50% increase in the cost of food in less than a year. This is in addition to food shortages occasioned by the 12-year-long insurgency, which has crippled commercial farming activities in Borno State. I'm not finding it easy to survive at all. Prices of things we're buying in the market last year has skyrocketed even up to 50 percent. Imagine buying uh, beans in the northern part of Nigeria, buying in 1,005, 1,006 is just too expensive and the inflation rate is affecting every family in the country now. So we're not really getting it very easy. I don't have any choice than to increase it because if I buy at a higher price, I will sell at a higher price. Because if I didn't increase it, that means me too, I'm, not, I'm going to be out of business within a short time. I might not see the money to even transact another uh, business. So I better increase. According to how I bought, I will sell according to how I bought. Business women like Azomta here have no choice but to throw that cost to the public. The call is for the government to be more deliberate, especially with the agricultural sector, so that this food crisis that is breaking the backs of so many Nigerians can be averted before it gets too late. Kayla Megua, Channel Television News. Same with agriculture and rising food prices, but this time in Yobe State. In this special report, our correspondent in Yobe State reveals that farmers say that most of the government's policies and services do not reach real farmers at the grassroots. Nigeria had in the year 2020 and 2021 recorded a hike in food prices, either as a result of poor rainfall, climate change, armed conflicts or lack of proper information on agricultural activities for rural farmers. Recently, the United Nations resident and humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria, Edward Cullen, revealed that 4.4 million residents of Adamawa, Borno and Yobe states are in need of food assistance. We are like at a tipping point, you know, to a catastrophic food security situation if necessary actions are not taken. 
When we did the uh, country harmonized uh, um, uh, food security assessment, which is done by World Food Program, FAO, and the government of Nigeria, in general here for in the, in the northeast, 4.4 million people were in need of urgent um, humanitarian assistance, especially during this lean period now. While the food crisis lingers, some farmers are asking the government to enhance its agricultural policies, noting that most times the services do not go to the doorsteps of the real farmers. According to them, services such as tractor hiring, supply of fertilizer and improved seeds are difficult to access lately as they are only found in the hands of the elite, while the insecurity has also contributed to the food crisis. There are some areas where you cannot go down there because of the security challenges. And when there's any problem, uh, the gate that is leading to the township will be closed by the security men. So a lot of farmers are in fear of their lives. To others, government's policy on agricultural extension services have been weakened, leaving the farmers in the rural areas without proper knowledge on farm cultivation. There is the need for federal government and state government to do more on the issue of agri-extension officers because people have now gone back to farms but they lack techniques on, of, of doing the farming. Although the state government explains that it has set up a state steering committee that will produce a five-year working plan to scale up food production, some experts are asking them to revive the large agro impute stores where farmers can access services easily. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation assisted the state in having a strategic five-year working plan which we sat down and look and we've produced a policy that we hope to take to the House of Assembly for final legislation. All of our local government are supposed, the state government or the local government are supposed to have large agro input stores that contains fertilizer, herbicide, insecticide. All year round farmers will come and access them as they go to access those things now in the open market. Which is, which is subject to the uh, uh, process of demand and supply. With the regular fall in oil prices in the international markets, farmers are of the opinion that the federal government must come up with improved ways of supporting the agricultural activities so as to diversify the economy of the country as well as create jobs for its citizens. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the NCDC, has confirmed in an update that Nigeria has recorded 964 more COVID-19 cases, which makes this the highest number of infections in two weeks. According to data sourced by the agency, new COVID-19 infections were confirmed in 20 states, including the federal capital territory Abuja, with Lagos retaining the EPI center status with 456, followed by Undo with 180 more cases, followed by Edo with 66, River 62, and Niger 62. As of Sunday morning, 182,468 individuals had been discharged as 995,052 cases had been confirmed nationwide with 2,544 recorded deaths attributed to COVID-19 complications since the index case in February 2020. The Nigerian government has condemned the recent coup d'etat in the Republic of Guinea, describing it as a clear violation of the ECOWAS protocol on democracy and good governance. A statement from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says the government of Nigeria also con strongly condemns and rejects any unconstitutional change of government and calls on those behind the coup to restore the constitutional order without delay and protect all lives and property. Guinea's President Alpha Conde is believed to be in the custody of the country's special forces following what soldiers say is a coup that happened earlier today. Before the military announcement about the takeover, 
A video appeared on social media purportedly showing Guinea's president, Alpha Conde, being detained by army special forces. He is seen wearing jeans and a printed shirt and does not have any visible injuries. It followed hours of heavy gunfire around the presidential palace in Conakry that left at least two civilians with gunshot wounds. Several sources claimed an elite national army on the presidential palace by mutinous forces had been put down. An unauthenticated video later emerged purportedly showing a statement from the man who several sources say led an elite national army unit behind the uprising. The man has been named as former French legionnaire Mamadi Dumbuya, who, wearing a military uniform and dark glasses, says in the video that the army had dissolved the government and sealed the country's borders in reaction to the social and economic situation in the country, disregard for people's rights and disrespect for democratic values. Soldiers involved in the uprising in Conakry also stated in a short broadcast on state television that they had dissolved the constitution and the government of Guinea. The presidential guard, supported by the loyalists and Republican defense and security forces, said in a statement that it contained a threat and repelled the group of assailants and that security and common operations are continuing to restore order and peace. President Alpha Conde has been in power since December 2010. He spent decades in opposition to a succession for regimes in the country, unsuccessfully running against President Lassana Conte in the 1993 and 1998 presidential elections and leading the rally of the Guinean people, an opposition party. Following the 2010 presidential election, he became the first freely elected president in the country's history and was re-elected in 2015, though the vote was tainted by allegations of fraud. South Africa's former president, Jacob Zuma, has been granted medical parole because of his ill health. Last month, authorities said the 79-year-old serving a 15-month sentence in Est Court Prison for contempt of court underwent unspecified surgery at an outside hospital where he had been sent for observation. He remained in hospital with more operations planned. His eligibility for medical parole follows a medical report received by the Department of Correctional Services. It means Mr. Zuma will complete the remainder of the sentence in the system of community corrections, whereby he must comply with a specific set of conditions and will be subjected to supervision until his sentence expires. The department spokesperson says the former president is still in hospital, but could go home to continue receiving medical care. He has given no details of Zuma's illness his parole, nor whether his health had deteriorated since the surgery. Taliban militants have reportedly shot dead a policewoman in Firozok, the capital of central Gore province. She's been identified as Abanu Nigar. Relatives say she worked at the local prison and was eight months pregnant. They also say three gunmen arrived at the house on Saturday and searched it before tying members of the family up and killing Banu. The Taliban has denied any involvement in her death and say they are investigating the incident, reiterating that the Taliban already announced an amnesty for people who worked for the previous administration and put Nigar's murder down to personal enmity or something else. In sports news, since Barcelona 1992, Nigeria's uh, physically challenged athletes have won medals at the Paralympic Games. Making her eighth appearance at the Games, Nigeria went to 2020 Tokyo Paralympics with 22 athletes winning 10 medals. This report takes a look at their success so far and what can be done to ensure the athletes get enough support and recognition. Flora Ogunwa wins gold in the women's F54 javelin with a mark of 19.39 meters to ensure Team Nigeria ends the Tokyo Paralympic Games with four gold, one silver and five bronze medals. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for counting me worthy. 
success begets success. And in fact, immediately these people come down, the other athletes in Nigeria will be challenged. These athletes come to Nigeria's rescue whenever their compatriots fail to produce the desired results at the Olympics. Since making her debut at the Paralympics in 1992, Nigeria has won 80 medals including 40 gold, 19 silver and 21 bronze medals. Interestingly, powerlifting remains Nigeria's stronghold as it accounts for 54 medals, while athletics and table tennis have 21 and 5. With these achievements, are the athletes getting enough support and recognition? How much of competition do these guys get to attend before major tournaments of this nature? Do we just bring them into camping two, three weeks before a major tournament and expect them to go there and also perform magic? Because we, these, these guys seem to be miracle workers. Yes, we know that the government has said they would get the same amount of money as the Olympians. But after you get this money, what do you do for the next four years, to the next Olympic or the next Paralympic Games? That for me is the major concern. The reception of the powerlifters at the airport by the Federal Ministry of Youth and Sports Development may just be the beginning of celebrating these athletes. I want to call on all Nigerians to celebrate these athletes because they went to compete with the best in the world. So to celebrate them. But secondly, I want to call on corporate organizations to plug into our public-private partnership, the ADOPT initiative, to find a way to support these athletes in one way or the other. Their needs are not many, just the basic. They need to invest in modern facilities. We need to move with the world. We shouldn't be left behind in terms of facilities. So they should invest more in facilities and they should always reward us and something. Paris 2024 is in three years. It is expected that some of these issues raised will be addressed. USA Women's World Cup winning coach Jill Ellis says she would be open to everything when asked if playing football slam map tournament every two years was a good idea. Ellis who coached the United States to back-to-back -to -back World Cup triumphs in 2015 and 2019 has been appointed by FIFA to lead its technical advisory group on the future of the women's game. So I certainly recognize that that is a platform um, that is, you know, has a great reach and, and has been incredibly instrumental, I think, in, in trying to grow the game. Um, so, and, and I've heard the conversation for, for a few years now about the, the idea of a biennial World Cup. You know, I think from right now, what I would say is I'm open to everything and every initiative and every perspective that can, again, um, grow the landscape. So would that be under consideration? Certainly. Um, you know, but I think I want to learn more about it. I want to learn more about, uh, you know, the other, the other people that will be seating at the table, their perspective as well. And the main news again. The federal government has made a U-turn, expressing readiness to withdraw suit against resident doctors if they return to work. It's been a bountiful harvest for the PDP as members of the ruling APC joined its ranks in Adamawa and Kwara states 24 hours after the APC conducted its nationwide local government congresses. Armed bandits struck in Kassina State and abducted wife and children of a state lawmaker, leaving others injured. Conflicting reports have trailed the military takeover in Guinea as Nigeria's federal government condemned any attempt at forceful overthrow of President Alpha Conde. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.